Released on July 7, 2023, Resident Evil Death Island is the fourth CGI film in the Resident Evil series, and the fifth CGI outing for the series when you count Infinite Darkness. Sporting the largest cast of main characters since Resident Evil 6, and the most for a CGI film, plus an intricate plot that brings them all together to fight a new terror, the movie is an ambitious undertaking that aims to be something truly special and memorable. So, did it succeed? Did it live up to its incredible potential? Or did it crash and burn? Well, that is what I want to talk about in this video. Dear viewer, I present to you my review of Resident Evil Death Island. Welcome to Alcatraz. I'm Dylan Blake. Now, admittedly, the setup for this movie is extremely cliché, standard, and overdone. A new virus appears and it starts to spread, causing several harrowing incidents. What or who is behind the said virus is a mystery, forcing our heroes to go around searching for clues until they eventually find who is responsible. Who always ends up being some madman that had something terrible happen to him. So he wants to watch the world burn in order to cleanse it or upset the status quo or to have others experience what he experienced or to bring to light the horrors that are often covered up by the very people responsible for them, etc. In the end, the madman, the villain, turns into a giant monstrosity that must be destroyed, and their plan always fails. This storyline has been used several times, not just in Resident Evil, but also in a lot of other places. If this was all Death Island had going for it in terms of plot, then you could easily write it off as more of the same, uncreative, etc. However, thankfully, Death Island uses this tired formula in a new way that is refreshing and thought-provoking. It uses the villain, Dylan, his plan and his motivations to directly challenge the morality of the heroes. Are they really on the side of justice, fighting to save innocent people and the world? Or are they just puppets for those they work for, who are mostly corrupt individuals that profit from and exploit the suffering of others. People that have no problem with causing destruction, so long as they are unaffected by it and they still get to line their pockets. The very same type of people behind the entity that started it all. Umbrella. Can the heroes really call themselves, well, heroes, when they protect and work for the very same kind of people they loathe and want to bring down. Dylan takes the question of who's really good and who's really evil even further by straight up roasting Leon, Claire, and Chris, saying that Leon works for the government, who often lie and cover up things, Claire works for TerraSave, who can only provide bandages instead of dealing with the root of the problem, and Chris always has casualties during his missions, and yet he always comes back with more people that will likely end up dead. Dylan makes them all wonder if they are really the good guys, and if there is even such a thing as good and bad. 
it's this duality, this existential and almost philosophical dilemma that gives Death Island weight and meaning, and what saves it from being just another dose of the same thing we have seen and experienced several times before. Additionally, making Dylan be a survivor of the Raccoon City incident just adds more layers to what he says and does, since it means that just like those he is judging, he too saw the horrors of that fateful night. He too was forced to do awful things he regrets, and the nightmare he experienced is what drives him. So he is like Leon, Jill, Claire, and Chris in this regard. The difference is that while he chose to bring ruin to the world that birthed such a tragedy, they chose to bring salvation to it instead, hoping to prevent further catastrophes. So the difference between them ultimately comes down to the choice they made which is what Leon himself says to sum up and ultimately conclude the situation. He made his choice. We made ours. <clears throat> That's all. Unfortunately though, this comment from Leon pushes the conundrum to the side, and it is never revisited again. Therefore, while it is an interesting dilemma, and one that has a lot of implications, it is not given enough development and the characters don't really give it that much thought, nor do they hesitate in what they need or have to do. They are sure that they are the good guys and that Dylan is the villain. Nothing more, nothing less. Which is fine, I am definitely not asking the movie to paint the heroes as the bad guys and the bad guy as the good guy. I just wanted it to further explore and give more depth to such an intricate dichotomy. I wanted the characters to question and doubt themselves a bit before arriving at the same conclusion they got to. This would have given the whole narrative a lot more importance. Additionally, Rebecca avoids the question entirely by not being present, and Jill is not attacked personally like the other three are, at least not to the same degree. I think that the movie's runtime is largely to blame for this and for a lot of other issues I have with it. Death Island comes in at just a little over an hour and 30 minutes including credits, so it barely makes it to feature length, and it is the shortest of the animated films in the series. If it was a longer movie, then it would have had more time to flesh out the fascinating moral questions at the center of its story, which would have elevated the movie even more. Though at least the characters do accept that there is some truth to Dylan's words, but this does not excuse his actions and he went about solving things in the wrong way. Finally, I love that Death Island is so clearly connected to the previous movie, Bendera. All the other movies, Bendera included, are loosely linked, if at all. You can honestly watch any of them without watching the others, and you won't be lost. Death Island, however, is a direct follow-up to Bendera since Dylan worked with Glenn Arias, the villain of Bendera, and Maria, who was his accomplice, now helps Dylan, hoping to get revenge for her father's death in Bendera. It's always nice to have a continuity, 
and I was pleasantly surprised when the previous film was so clearly included in the new one. I also give the movie extra points for its virus, which can be administered on specific targets remotely via tiny robots, and it cannot spread via bites. So victims turn spontaneously, unpredictably, and at any point without noticing when they got infected. This leads to some very suspenseful and chaotic moments, though sadly not enough of them. Still, I award the points for such a creative virus. Let's do it. Yeah. It's not surprising that the film's biggest selling point is also its greatest asset. Bringing together five iconic main characters from the series, arguably the five most memorable and important ones at that, is honestly just brilliant. It is the thing that made me look forward to the movie the most. And while not without flaws, the way it uses its impressive cast proves to be the film's best trick by far. Seeing the Redfield siblings on screen together and interacting for the first time since Code Veronica, the unlikely but amusing pairing of Leon and Jill, the hilarious duo of Leon and Chris, the classic partnership of Jill and Chris for the first time since Resident Evil 5, Leon, Jill and Chris battling the final boss together, Claire and Rebecca working together to support them, and doing some fighting too, and all five of them fighting side by side. All of this was honestly just so amazing to watch that even if the movie is far from perfect, I still had a blast watching it. It allowed all these characters to work together for the first time ever, or for the first time in a while, or again. All these scenarios make for moments that we, as fans, desperately wanted to see, or were looking forward to seeing, or are glad to witness again. Death Island absolutely delivered where it counted the most. It leveraged its best feature wonderfully. Heck, even just seeing Rebecca and Honigan collaborate was exciting. Even if we only hear Honigan, meaning we don't actually see her. However, like I said before, it did not do so without flaws. Claire and Chris definitely needed more time together, especially considering just how long it has been since we last saw them as such. They also should have been given more to do in terms of action. Leon and Jill run away with most of it. Which is perfectly fine, but the others should have been given more time to shine in combat as well. And this extends to Rebecca. Though I understand the hesitation to make Claire and Rebecca fight too much, considering that they are more likely to work behind the scenes. However, they know their way around a fight, and an ensemble cast like this works best when everyone in it gets to contribute the same or a similar amount. I once again blame runtime. If the movie was longer, then there would have been more time to allot to each character. Though honestly, considering the time constraints, it's impressive how much each character got to and while their screen times were uneven, at least they all got a fair bit to do. It did not feel like any of them was given the short end of the stick. 
one thing, however, that I can 100% praise when it comes to characters is Jill. Death Island marks the first time we see her canonically since Resident Evil 5. So it's the first time we get to see her carrying on with her normal life post-Wesker brainwashing. It was fascinating to see how said event affected her, how it changed the way she thinks and approaches things, and how it affects her relationship with Chris. Their interactions as Jill tries to fight her demons and Chris tries to stop her from endangering herself out of pure concern are some of the best moments in the film. Though again, like everything else I have discussed so far, if the movie was longer, then their dilemma could have been explored further. Still, seeing a post-Resident Evil 5 Jill is something I have always wanted to see, and the games have never delivered it. Therefore I am very happy that I finally got to see it. Now since we are on the topic of Jill, there are a couple of inconsistencies with her that bother me. First, she somehow knows Leon and Leon knows her. They have never appeared on screen together canonically before this movie. And yet, somehow, when they see each other in the movie, they already know who the other is. I was honestly really looking forward to them meeting for the first time, but instead of a grand encounter with equally memorable introductions, this happens. Leon? Well, what do you know? Jill Valentine. This was honestly a bit disappointing, though their scenes together do make up for this. I suspect that they did not know each other personally. They probably had never seen each other prior to this movie. They just know who the other is due to their mutual friends Claire, Rebecca, and Chris. The second inconsistency with her is her design. The way she looks. Now don't get me wrong, I do not think that she looks bad or anything like this, quite the contrary in fact. My problem is that she looks exactly like she does in the Resident Evil 3 remake, which takes place 17 years before this movie. And not only does she look identical, but she also wears basically the same outfit. She honestly looks uncanny, like she was copy-pasted from the RE3 remake. Now I get that she ages at a slower rate due to what Wesker did to her, so it's understandable that she still looks young. But not that she looks exactly like she did 17 years ago. Especially when she did not look anything like this in Resident Evil 5, which again is the last time, canonically, that we saw her. I think that they just wanted her to look exactly like she does in her most recent in-game appearance, which is the remake of Resident Evil 3, Logic Be Damned. Though it is worth mentioning that they did not do this with the other characters. Probably because it would not make sense, lore-wise, for say Leon to look exactly like he does in the RE4 remake. Still, even with these explanations, Jill just looks out of place in the movie. Which is a little jarring. It's not a deal breaker, it's just odd. Finally, I think that they could have done a much better job with getting the characters together. Leon does have a mission, but he basically just shows up in Alcatraz out of nowhere, when it's convenient for the plot. 
and the Claire calls Jill, Rebecca and the Chris off screen. And they then just meet up to discuss the situation at hand with very little fanfare. They should have found the more cohesive ways to get the cast together. This is another thing that can be blamed on the runtime. Movies are of course meant to be entertaining. So while the story and characters are very important, their value would decrease tremendously if the film is not enjoyable. Thankfully, while certainly not perfect, Death Island is definitely a fun experience. First, the movie is hilarious, thanks mostly to Leon who is always on point with his humorous one-liners. Well, if it isn't, whoever you are... I know what I'm gonna take away from this experience. Prison tours suck. <laughs> I cannot emphasize just how many times I found myself laughing boisterously due to him. Especially because his banter with the more serious characters namely Jill and the Chris, is just brilliant. You know how to use this? It's gonna trigger, doesn't it? Down. A little higher? Yeah. They bounce off each other incredibly well. Second, the action is just superb, which is par for the course with the Resident Evil CGI films. The animation is always so fluid and smooth. The fight scenes are tightly choreographed, creatively put together and flawlessly executed. They are just a joy and a thrill to watch, which really elevates the movie. Additionally, the movie just has so many great moments for longtime fans that it's difficult not to smile from ear to ear. It also manages to pack in several great scares and tense moments, which is admirable considering that the film is geared mostly towards action, even though this is Resident Evil, meaning that the horror should be front and center. Finally, I just want to discuss the animation in this section as well. Like I stated earlier, the animation is fantastic during action scenes, but this isn't the only place where it shines. Characters, creatures, and locations look great. Characters especially stand out for looking so lively and filled with emotion. They articulate very well with their expressions, which makes every bit of dialogue they deliver that much better. A few of them, mostly side and background characters, do look a little uncanny though. The setting of a movie can make or break it. An amazing location can elevate a movie, while a bad one can sink it. And I think this goes double for a horror movie, since the setting adds much to the suspense and the terror. Alcatraz Island is an amazing setting even if this is not the first time I have seen it overrun with zombies. It's claustrophobic, maze-like, with dark underground tunnels, old, decrepit, abandoned, and completely isolated, since it is surrounded by water. It is the perfect location for anything horror. However, sadly, it is another victim of the runtime. While it contributes to some great moments of both action and suspense, 
it really could have been put to even better use, which would have certainly added to the mood and the atmosphere of the movie. The dark tunnels especially are severely underused, like when they skip Leon and Jill's traversal of an especially scary part of them. A good Resident Evil anything lives or dies by its creatures, since they carry most of the burden when it comes to the horror aspect. I think that Death Island excels here. The aquatic liquors are terrifying. An already fearsome and intimidating foe is made even scarier and they are put to great use not only by fighting Jill and Leon, but also by having the two of them freeze in fear, hoping to avoid their blind adversary. It's just a shame that we never see a scene of anyone trying to swim quietly in order to sneak past these liquors in open water. This would have been extremely tense. The giant mutated shark is another awesome addition to the cast of creatures. I love when it swims stealthily under the boat Jill, Claire and Chris use to get to the island. This is not only scary, but it also clues us in to the fact that there is a giant shark on the prowl. Its night attack on the team that escorts Rebecca into the island is pretty awesome. Also, I just love that this beast reminds me of the Neptune from the first Resident Evil, who are one of my favorite creatures from the series. Additionally, it contributes to the final boss. Speaking of which, Finally, the final boss is easily the best one out of all the CGI movies. It's enormous, hideous, very resilient, it can fight on land and on water, it's quite terrifying and very intimidating. It's truly a memorable foe, and I cannot think of a better way to end a Resident Evil anything, then having the characters face such a spectacular and horrific foe. So, overall, Resident Evil Death Island accomplishes a lot in 91 minutes. It manages to bring together an amazing ensemble cast made up of some of the finest characters in the series, to deepen and expand their relationships in believable and much-needed ways, to give them a good reason to band and fight together, to pit them up against a villain that, while cliché, manages to shake their beliefs and their notions of good and evil, while also giving them a chance to define themselves even more as characters, all of this bundled together in a beautifully and flawlessly animated adventure that is packed to the brim with plenty to laugh and scream about, and takes place in a setting that just oozes horror, filled and surrounded by nightmarish creatures. While the film is certainly not perfect, mostly due to a shorter than usual runtime that prevents it, from fully exploring and utilizing all the fantastic assets at its disposal, it still manages to be a thrilling and fun ride that is sure to delight anyone that loves Resident Evil and its memorable characters. Please do share your thoughts on Death Island in the comments down below. Also, please do drop a like if you enjoyed the video and subscribe for more Resident Evil.
Additionally, down in the description, I have affiliate links for GameStop, which is where I buy all my gaming related stuff, affiliate links for Amazon, which is where I buy all my stuff that is not gaming related or groceries, and a link to my buy me a coffee page. These links will all allow you to support me directly if you would like to. I would very much appreciate it. Also, I have a link to my main channel where I cover Pokemon. If this is something that would interest you, then please check said channel out. Thank you so very much for watching and let's meet again in the next video.